open propagation of Islam. The first three years of the Prophet, peace be upon him's mission, had focused on bringing the message of Islam to individuals. A discerning few among the Quraysh and other tribes had embraced Islam, but their numbers were hardly overwhelming. Now Allah ordered his messenger, peace be upon him, to warn his kinsmen about idolatry. He was also asked to keep in his fold those who believed in the message and to renounce ties with those who rejected his message. After receiving this order, the Prophet, peace be upon him, assembled his nearest kindred, the tribe of Banu Hashim, including a few people from Banu Mutlib. Addressing the gathering, he, peace be upon him, first praised and glorified Allah and bore witness to his oneness. Then he told them, I am the messenger of Allah and have been sent to you in particular and to all mankind in general. I swear by Allah that you will die in the same way you sleep every night and you will be resurrected, similar to how you rise from sleep in the morning. Following this, your account will be taken from you and then your good will be paid with good and bad with bad. The Prophet, peace be upon him's audience, let him have his say. His uncle, Abu Lahab, was alone in saying, Stop him before all Arabia unites against him. If you hand him over to them, then you will be put to disgrace, and if you try to save him, you will be killed. The Prophet, peace be upon him's other uncle, Abu Talib, said, I swear by Allah that we will protect him as long as we live. Abu Talib then told his nephew, You try to fulfil what you have been ordered to do. By Allah, I shall always defend you, even though I prefer not to abandon the religion of Abdul Muttalib. During the same period, Allah told the Prophet, peace be upon him, announce openly what you are commanded and withdraw from the idolaters. In compliance with Allah's order, he ascended the mounts of Mount Safa, a small rocky hill near the Qaba, and cried out from the highest point, Ya Sabaha. The cry Ya Sabaha was normally used to warn citizens of impending doom, surprise attacks or other great calamities. Once he had alerted his fellow Makkans that something terrible was upon them, the Prophet, peace be upon him, then called every family and every household by name. O sons of Fikhr, O sons of Adi, O sons of Abdul Munaf, O sons of Abdul Mutalib, O sons of... The people heard their names being called and they rushed to Mount Safa. Those who were unable to go themselves sent someone on their behalf to see what happened. When they were all assembled, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, If I told you the horsemen were advancing to attack you from the valley on the other side of this hill, would you believe me? Yes, they replied, bewildered at his question. We have always found you honest. Then he said to them, I'm here to warn you before a severe chastisement reaches you. I see the enemy charging towards you and I want to protect you from his sword, but I fear he will strike you before I can give you warning. This is why I have cried out to you atop this hill. After this vivid analogy, the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked them to save themselves by declaring that Allah was one and that he, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was his messenger. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He also explained to them that this testimony, Shahada, was the only source of salvation in this world and in the hereafter. He tried to make them understand that if they clung to polytheism and rejected the message he had brought to them, they would face Allah's punishment and that he, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would not be able to save them despite his status as Allah's messenger. Addressing all segments of Makkan society, he further said, O people of Quraysh, ransom yourselves from Allah and save yourselves from the fire of hell, for I am not the master of your gain and loss, nor can I be of any help to saving you from Allah. O Banu Qab bin Lu'ay, save yourselves from hell, for I am not the master of your gain and loss. O Banu Qusay, save yourselves from hell. O Banu Abdu Munaf, save yourselves from hell, for I am not the master of your gain and loss. O Banu Hashim, save yourselves from hell. O Banu Abdul Muttalib, save yourselves from hell, for I am not the master of your gain and loss, and cannot save you from Allah. Take from my property as much as you desire, but I have no power to save you from Allah. O Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, I can be of no help to you in saving you from Allah. O aunt of the messenger, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, I can be of no help to you in saving you from Allah. O Fatima, daughter of the messenger, 
Ask for whatever you want from my property, but save yourself from hell. I cannot be of any help to you either, from Allah. However, I am related to you, and I will fulfill my obligations accordingly. After listening to this warning from the Prophet, peace be upon him, the assembly dispersed. There is no record of their immediate support or opposition. However, Abu Lahab is reported to have said, enraged, May you be cursed. Is it for this you have brought us here? Generally, the Prophet's audience seems to have been somewhat amazed at the Prophet, peace be upon him's outpourings, and could not decide just then as to what they should do. Once they returned to their homes, however, their arrogance reasserted itself, and they disdained the Prophet, peace be upon him's warnings and exhortation. Thus, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed by their elders, they would jeer, Is this the one who was appointed a messenger of Allah? Is this the boy of Abu Qabsha who was addressed from the sky? Abu Qabsha was an ancestor of the Prophet, peace be upon him, on his mother's side. He had abandoned the paganism of the Quraysh and embraced Christianity. Hence, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, began proclaiming the monotheistic message of Islam, the Quraysh were quick to link him with another so-called renegade of their society. Despite the taunts of his tribesmen and their increasing hostility, the Prophet, peace be upon him, remained firm in his mission and began to invite people to Islam. He would recite verses from the Book of Allah, giving his people the same message that previous prophets had given to their people. He would say, O my people, worship Allah without any partners or intermediaries, for none is your God except Allah. He also began to pray to Allah in public, offering prayers in the courtyard surrounding the Qaba. The Prophet, peace be upon him, preaching gradually gained ground. As more people, one by one, came into the fold of Islam, a gap started widening between the believers and non-believers, even in the same house. Of course, this only increased the resentment and hostility of the Quraysh, who found it unforgivable that the new Muslims would choose Islam over family, tribe and culture, ties they deemed sacrosanct. With the Muslims growing in number, the Quraysh became increasingly perturbed. It was close to the time of the annual pilgrimage, Hajj, to the Qaba and people from all over the peninsula were expected in Makkah before long. The Quraysh feared the Muslims would attract and influence the visitors. They also worried about the loss of face that would ensue if a rival religion flourished in the stronghold of their gods. A delegation of the Quraysh called on Walid bin Mughira, who was old and a man of standing. He said, O people of Quraysh, the time of Hajj has come, and people from all sides will come to you. They have all heard about Muhammad, peace be upon him, so agree upon what to say about him, lest you contradict one another. The people said, you say something and decide on a course for us. He said, you speak and I shall listen to you. The people said, well, we shall say that he is a soothsayer. He is not a soothsayer, said Walid. He neither speaks nor versifies like them. Then we shall say he is mad, someone suggested. He is not mad, Walid said. We all know the signs of madness. He does not behave erratically, nor is his speech confused. Then we shall say that he is a poet. But he is not a poet, Valid pointed out. We know the different kinds of poetry, and his words can't be compared to any of them. He is therefore not a poet. Well, we shall say he is a sorcerer, another suggested haplessly. He is not a sorcerer either. We have seen sorcery and sorcerers. He practices neither the art of exorcism nor the tying of knots, Valid explained. The people said, what shall we say then? Valid thought for a moment and said, by God, his words are sweet, fresh and attractive. His root is firm and his branches are fruitful. Hence, whatever you claim about him will not be believed. However, it is more convincing, in my opinion, if you were to present him as a sorcerer. You should say that he has brought a message by which he creates a rift between father and son, brother and brother, husband and wife. Under his influence, family ties have been rent asunder, and every day families break up because of him. Having agreed upon this line of defence, the Quraysh formed small groups to spread the propaganda. They waited along different paths leading the pilgrims to their destination, and would caution every passerby about the Prophet, peace, peace be upon him with the result that almost everyone formed an impression of the Prophet, peace be upon him, without having seen or heard him. When the days of Hajj came, the Prophet, peace be upon him, rose to meet the pilgrims in gatherings. He also called on them at their camps to invite them to Islam. He would say, 
O people, say La ilaha illallah and you will attain success. Abu Lahab, meanwhile, would walk behind the Prophet, peace be upon him, belittling him. Thus, by the time the pilgrims returned from Hajj that year, all of Arabia knew of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his mission, either through his own efforts or those of his detractors. After performing Hajj, the pilgrims returned home to face the disquieting issue of a new rival religion. Having lapsed into polytheism for so long, the Arabs saw Islam as a new religion, one they had to stamp out. They refused to acknowledge that it was simply a return to the pristine monotheism preached by their forefathers, Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them. The outraged pagans devised various ways to deal with the current situation, confident that these plans, when put into action, would vanquish the threat of Islam. Their tactics included ridicule, abuse, slander, debate and open harassment of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his followers. To demoralise and demean the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, the pagan Arabs began to vilify him. This is a poet, a madman, a soothsayer. Satan comes to him and teaches him. He is a sorcerer, a liar. When they encounter the Prophet, peace be upon him, they would glare at him and say scornfully, This is the man who decries our gods. The idolaters would taunt the Muslims as they passed by them. Look, the rulers of the earth come to you, as Allah entrusted us to them. This was a contemptuous reference to the weak social stature of the Muslim minority who had dared to confront the powerful majority. The unjust ridicule and condemnation deeply hurt even the Prophet, peace be upon him. Allah says, We know that your breast is distressed by what they say. Quran 15, colon 97. Allah then revealed verses of inspiration and comfort to help the Prophet, peace be upon him, remain steadfast. Therefore, magnify the praises of your Lord and be among those who prostrate themselves before him. Quran 15, 98. In other verses, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was told that Allah alone would judge the evildoers and polytheists and that they would soon reap the fruit of their evil deeds. Consoling himself and his followers, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the messengers who came before me have also been laughed at and condemned, but the mockers found themselves surrounded on all sides by their own disdain. Not content with slandering and humiliating the Prophet, peace be upon him, the pagans also attempted to keep others from hearing the Prophet, peace be upon him's message. Whenever he tried to preach to a group of people, the pagans would disperse the crowd before he had a chance to convey his message. The first opportunity to preach in public came in Ramadan of the fifth year of the Prophet, peace be upon him's mission. It was then that he recited Surah Al-Najm before a large gathering. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, recited the Qur'an, which was usually during the latter part of the night in voluntary prayer, the polytheist would make profane remarks about the Qur'an, the one who had revealed it and the one who had brought it to the people. Hence, Allah ordered the Prophet, peace be upon him, to lower his voice when reciting. Recite your prayers neither in a very loud voice nor silently. Follow a middle course, Quran 17, colon 110. To divert the people's attention away from the stories of the Quran, Nadir bin Harith went to Hira and Syria and came back with the legends of Dara, Darius, Sikandar, Alexander and Sfandia, a Persian king. Whenever he learned that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was addressing an assembly, he would rush there and begin narrating these tales, he would then ask listeners how the orations of Muhammad, peace be upon him, could possibly be superior to his. Nadir then went a step further and purchased singing girls. If he heard that a person was considering becoming Muslim, he would carry the person to a courtesan and ask her to entertain him and to serve him food and drink. Then he would tell the would-be Muslim that the company of the courtesan was far better than what Muhammad, peace be upon him, had to say. Allah then revealed the following verse. There are among men those who ignorantly purchase meaningless tales to mislead men from the path of Allah, and they would take the words of Allah as mockery. They will certainly endure a humiliating punishment. Quran 31, colon 6. When the pagans did not succeed in stamping out Islam by mocking the Prophet, peace be upon him, or by diverting people's attention from his teachings, they then attempted to discredit him. First, they claimed that the Qur'an was nothing but a bundle of confused dreams which Muhammad, peace be upon him, had at night and then recited during the day. Next, 
They claimed that he had concocted the Qur'an line by line, all by himself, while at other times they said that a certain man composed the Qur'an for him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, then simply memorized and recited the verses. On other occasions, the pagan said that the Qur'an was all lies he had fabricated with the help of others. They also asserted that the Qur'an was a collection of folk tales and ancient stories which Muhammad, peace be upon him, recited morning and evening. They even went so far as to say that an evil jinn or demon brought the verses of the Qur'an to Muhammad, peace be upon him. Thereupon, Allah said, Shall I inform you about those upon whom demons descend? They descend upon every sinful liar. Qur'an 26, colon 221-222. The pagans also spread the rumour that the Prophet, peace be upon him, suffered from fits and seizures. These frenzied fits, the pagans claimed, were the source of Muhammad, peace be upon him's poetic inspiration. In reply to this claim, Allah said, As for poets, only those who are astray, follow them. They ramble aimlessly about every subject, claiming to have done things that they have not done. Quran 26, colon 224-226 In this verse, Allah challenges the pagans that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a poet. Three characteristics of poets are mentioned. Their followers are deviants, they expound about subjects without discretion, and they boast about deeds they did not perform. When we scrutinise the Prophet, peace be upon him's character, and those of his followers, however, we find that they were upright. Muhammad, peace be upon him's teachings, focused on calling people to worship Allah, the one God, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, put his teachings into action and lived by the precepts he taught his followers. There were three tenets of the Prophet, peace be upon him's teachings, that the pagans found unacceptable. In fact, these three concepts were the source of much of the discord between them and the Muslims. The notion of resurrection on the Day of Judgment, the idea of a mortal prophet, and the concept of the unity of Allah, Tawheed, were in their eyes incredible and absurd. The concept of resurrection, they believed, was no more than a fanciful idea. They would say, how can we be raised again after being reduced to dust and bone? How can our ancestors be brought back to life? Talking among themselves, they would mock the Prophet peace be upon him's teaching regarding the resurrection and the hereafter. Come, I will show you someone who claims that you will be raised anew after being torn into pieces. Who knows whether he is inventing stories about God or has gone mad? Allah himself explains the notion of resurrection in several verses of the Qur'an. Whereas the pagans found it illogical, the Qur'an appeals to our sense of justice and presents resurrection as an essential natural component of the life cycle. The Qur'an asks us to imagine the case of an oppressor who dies without having been punished for the suffering he inflicted. In addition, what about the case of someone who dies having suffered unjustly at the hands of an oppressor? Alternatively, we may even consider the case of a virtuous person who dies without having been rewarded for his virtue or an evil person who has never been punished for his unjust deeds. If nothing happens to a person after death, and if death is indeed the final chapter of our lives, then each person mentioned above would merely lie in a grave for eternity. In this case, the oppressors and wrongdoers, in fact, would emerge victorious because death would protect them from being held accountable for their actions, while those who suffered unjustly in this life would never be rewarded. However, our sense of justice rejects the idea that such an unfair system could have been created by Allah, who is more than just any of his creations. Such a corrupt system would encourage people to do as they pleased without fear of retribution. Allah says in the Qur'an, Shall we treat those who believe the same as those who are corrupt? What has happened to you? How can you believe such a thing? Qur'an 68, colon 35-36 Or, or do those who spread evil think that we shall consider them equal to the virtuous believers, both in this world and in the next? How corrupt is their judgment? Qur'an 45, colon 21 Is it rational to believe that Allah can give life to that which is dead? Allah says, what is more difficult, to create you or the heavens that he placed above your heads? Quran 79, colon 27. Do they not understand that Allah, he who created the heavens and earth effortlessly, is able to resurrect the dead? Indeed, Allah has power over all things. Quran 46, colon 33.
He also says, just as we began creation, we shall repeat it once again. This is a promise that we have made, and we shall certainly carry it out. Quran 21, colon 104. Others argued that although Allah is the creator of the universe, it is impossible to reconstruct something once it has been destroyed. Allah refutes this argument, pointing out that it is easier to reconstruct and revive something than to create it from nothing. Have we become exhausted after creating the universe once? Verily, they are confused about the next act of creation. Quran 50, colon 15. Although the Quraysh considered Muhammad, peace be upon him, be a truthful man, they had difficulty accepting him as a prophet and messenger of Allah. They believed that a mere man could not be entrusted with such a lofty office. When Muhammad, peace be upon him, proclaimed his prophethood and messengership, the Quraysh responded by saying, What kind of messenger is this that eats food and walks through the markets? Quran 25, 25,7 Allah describes the confusion of the Quraysh in the next verse. They marvel that a warner has risen from among them. Quran 50, 2 The Quraysh also rejected the idea that mortals could be inspired by Allah. Allah contradicted this assumption in the following verse. Ask them, who then revealed the book that Moses, peace be upon him, bought? A source of light and guidance for mankind. Quran 6, 91. Numerous parallels are mentioned in the Quran in which a nation refused to follow a prophet because he was of flesh and blood. You are no more than a man like us. Quran 14, colon 10. The Quran depicts the prophets as replying to their detractors. True, we are men like you, but Allah gives his blessings to whomever he pleases. Quran 14, colon 11. All of Allah's prophets and messengers, then, were mere mortals, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, was no exception. Allah did not send angels as messengers because mortals would not be able to follow in the footsteps of a supernatural being. The role of Allah's messengers was not only to communicate Allah's message to mankind, but also to show mortals how to apply this divine message in an earthly human setting. Who could perform such a task better than a mortal messenger could? If Allah had sent angels as messengers, the polytheist would have been justified in asking How can we imitate supernatural beings? This divine wisdom is expressed in the following verse as well. And had we sent him an angel, we would have given him the form of a man. This would have confused them even more. Quran 6, 9. Now, since the polytheists admitted that Ibrahim, Ismail and Musa, peace be upon them, were all prophets as well as men, they could no longer challenge Muhammad, peace be upon him's prophethood arguing that he was human. Therefore, they then ridicule the idea that Allah would appoint a once destitute orphan as his prophet. Why would Allah pass over more dignified men of the Quraysh or Taqif tribes? Why was not this Quran revealed to someone of great importance from either Makkah or Taif? Quran 43, colon 31. Allah's reply to their question was succinct. Will they determine how to distribute the mercy of your Lord, Qur'an 43, colon 32. The Qur'an, prophethood, inspiration, all are part of Allah's mercy and he alone decides how it should be distributed. Allah knows best who should receive his message, Qur'an 6, colon 124. Unable to question Allah's right to bless whomever he wished with prophethood, the polytheists now developed a different argument to discredit Muhammad peace be upon him. Kings, they pointed out, are surrounded by splendour and vast wealth and only the most honourable dignitaries are allowed in their presence. Such kings are aided by the wisest advisers and have hundreds of servants, bodyguards and wives. How was it, they asked, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, the emissary of Allah, was forced to wander about in the marketplace in order to earn his bread? They say, Why doesn't an angel descend from the heavens to accompany him while he admonishes us? Or why hasn't a great treasure been bestowed upon him or a garden that he can eat from? The unjust among them say, you follow none but a man who is possessed. Quran 25, 7-8 The polytheists argued that Muhammad, peace be upon him, if he were indeed a prophet sent by Allah, 
should resemble a royal dignitary. Where were his palaces, his wealth, his royal entourage? He did not even have the companionship of a single angel to help him with his preaching. The prophet, peace be upon him, however, saw his mission in quite different terms. He was sent to deliver Allah's message to all people, rich and poor, strong and weak, free and enslaved. If he put on the airs of a king, he would not be able to reach the majority of his audience. The objectives of his mission required him to live as an ordinary human being, to show people that Islam was compatible with everyday life and that it was not merely a tool to entertain kings, theologians and philosophers. The Qur'an refuted the expectations of the polytheists by using one word to describe his status that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a messenger. It might seem a little strange to us that the Quraysh would turn so viciously on one of their own. What was so unacceptable about what Muhammad, peace be upon him, preached? At the root of all the conflicts between Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the polytheists was the concept of monotheism, Tawheed, which the polytheists had corrupted into its antithesis, idolatry. At the same time, they accepted some of the components of monotheism. For example, they accepted that Allah is one in his personal self, attributes and actions. The polytheists also agreed with the Prophet, peace be upon him, on the following points. Allah is the sole creator of the universe. He is the Lord and provider of all living beings. He alone gives and takes life, and it is he who makes independent decisions, which no one can challenge. However, hand in hand with their belief in Allah's supremacy was their belief that certain individuals held special powers granted by Allah. These individuals, the polytheists claimed, could perform many miraculous feats, such as healing the sick and causing barren women to conceive. Some were believed to act as intermediaries when people prayed to them. These beings supposedly relayed the prayers to Allah. The polytheists then strove to please such people who supposedly held high-ranking stations close to Allah. By pleasing these demigods, they reason, one could please Allah. The people conceived many ways to please these friends of Allah. For example, it was common practice to build shrines over the graves of saints and holy men. People would visit these monuments with the belief that by rubbing the walls of the shrine or by walking around it several times, they would earn the favour of the person in whom honour it had been built. Some even made offerings of produce, goods, gold and animal sacrifice. These offerings would be given to the shrine attendants, who would then place the objects before the graves or idols. Generally, nothing could be offered directly without the aid of the attendants. However, animals were presented as offerings in a number of ways. Sometimes, worshippers would leave the animals free in the name of some holy man in order to seek his pleasure. These animals would graze and roam about at will, revered by the people. Sometimes they carried the animal to the home of the holy man and had it slaughtered there. This, however, was done in the name of the holy man. The polytheists would also organise a fair once or twice a year at shrines dedicated to certain individuals at which people gathered and performed the acts of worship and adoration mentioned above. Such fairs were often scheduled around the death anniversaries of these saints and people would journey long distances to attend these gatherings. All these acts of worship and adoration were performed in hopes of pleasing the dead holy men and winning their intercession. The pagans would address certain saints saying, O oh Father, answer my request and remove such and such hardship. The polytheists believed that the dead people that they prayed to could not only hear them, but could also answer their prayers with powers given to them by Allah or by interceding with Allah. Such were the practices of the pagans, associating partners with Allah by deifying human beings and inanimate objects, even as they denied his power to resurrect his creation. It was in this citadel of polytheism that the prophet, peace be upon him, was sent to preach the message of the one God and to teach people of his oneness. Many of the polytheists, however, viewed the message as unreasonable and untrue, and they clung to their own flawed beliefs about the nature of God. Has he made all of the gods into one God? 
This is something strange. We have not heard of any religion that has only one God. Surely this is nothing but an innovation. Quran 38, colon 5-7 Allah engages in debate with the pagans through the verses of the Quran. The pagans were asked how they could tell whether or not a person had been chosen by Allah and actually possessed the power of intercession. For example, how could one be sure that a person who claimed to be close to Allah was telling the truth? Essentially, there were only two ways to determine whether or not such an individual was telling the truth, by possessing knowledge of the unseen or by having access to a divine book. Allah addresses this point in the Qur'an when he asks, Does the unseen appear before them so that they can record it in their own books? Qur'an 68, colon 47. If you speak the truth, bring me a book revealed before this one or some traces of knowledge to support your claim. Qur'an 46, colon 4. And say, do you have any proof that you can bring before us? No, because you follow nothing but conjecture and your words are only lies. Qur'an 6, colon 148. The polytheists admitted that they did not have knowledge of the unseen, nor could they produce a divinely inspired book. Tradition and the wisdom of their ancestors were their sources of truth. The Qur'an quotes them as saying, We found our fathers following a certain religion, and we are following in their footsteps. Qur'an 43,23 These verses highlight the ignorance and helplessness of the polytheists, and Allah makes the matter clear when he says in the Qur'an, Truly, Allah knows, but you know not. Qur'an 16, colon 74. Referring to saints and intercessors, Allah leaves no doubt about their status. Verily, those whom you pray to besides Allah are servants like you, so call upon them and let them answer if you speak the truth. Qur'an 7, colon 194. Allah challenges those who still insist that there are individuals with special powers who can answer prayers. In verse after verse, Allah emphasizes the futility of praying to anyone other than Him. Those whom you pray to other than Allah do not even possess a qidmir, the thin membrane that covers a date stone. Quran 35, colon 13. If you pray to them, they will not hear you. Moreover, even if they did hear you, they could not answer your prayers, and on the day of judgment they will deny that they ask you to worship them. Who can inform you of these things better than Allah, he who knows all things? Quran 35, colon 14. Those whom they pray to other than Allah have not created a single thing. In fact, they themselves were created. Dead, utterly lifeless, they know not when they will be raised up. Quran 16, 20-21. And, do they associate partners with Allah that cannot create anything, partners that were created themselves? These partners cannot help those who pray to them, nor can they even help themselves. Quran 7, colon 191-192 The polytheists who lived during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, agreed with him that Allah created everything, that the gods they worshipped created nothing. How was it then, Allah asked them in the Quran, that they worshipped something that had been created instead of worshipping the one who created everything. The polytheists answered this by claiming that their ancestors had all prayed to other gods besides Allah. These ancestors and the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's ancestors were among them who had believed in the power of such gods. In addition, was it not true, they asked, that their ancestors were known for their wisdom and intelligence? How then? Could one question their religion? Allah answers their argument in the Quran by challenging their ancestors' wisdom in matters of religion. He characterizes them as misguided and incapable of understanding, as seen in the following verses. They found their fathers on the wrong path, so they hastily followed their footsteps. Quran 37, colon 69 to 70. Besides insisting on the wisdom of their polytheistic forefathers, the polytheist accused the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Muslims of disrespect to their gods and threatened them with the wrath of these false deities. We say that some of our gods have inflicted you with madness. Quran 11, 
colon 54. In answer to these weak threats, Allah reminds the idolaters of the absolute powerlessness of their gods. Motionless, mute and defenceless, how could these effigies harm the Muslims or destroy them? Have they feet to walk with, hands to grasp with, eyes to see with, ears to hear with? Say, call upon those you claim to be Allah's partners and then plot against me and give me no respite. Quran 7, colon 195. Allah sets forth a parable, saying, O people, a parable will be set before you, so listen to it carefully. Those whom you call upon and pray to, besides Allah, cannot create even a fly, even if they all gathered for this purpose. And if a fly should snatch anything from them, they would not be able to recover what the fly had taken from them. How feeble is the petitioner, how feeble the petitioned. Quran 22, colon 73. Some of the Muslims, tired of the insults to their faith, derided the helplessness of the pagan gods, as in this taunt about an idol who could not defend it itself against animal excrement. A god that lets foxes urinate over his head is certainly weak and base. Incensed, the polytheists heaped abuse on the Muslims as well as their lord. The degeneration of a profound spiritual conflict into the puerile name-calling was stopped when Allah forbade the Muslims to indulge in petty slurs, saying, Do not insult those who worship false gods, lest they ignorantly insult Allah in return. Quran 6, colon 108. As we have seen, every argument forwarded by the polytheists was refuted by Allah himself, while his prophet, peace be upon him, went about preaching his message undeterred by their ridicule and abuse. Realising the futility of verbal debates and disputes, the polytheists considered using force against Islam to deter people from the path of Allah. The notables and chieftains of each tribe began to ill-treat the Muslims among them, and a delegation of theirs approached Abu Talib. They demanded that he stop the Prophet, peace be upon him, from preaching. Persecution had begun in earnest, and several Muslim lives would be lost to the wrath of the Quraysh. Torture, exile and poverty were what the Quraysh promised, while paradise and Allah's grace were the rewards promised by Allah and his messenger, peace be upon him. Was it surprising that despite physical limitations, the early Muslims chose to trade their earthly lots for the hereafter?